Okay, I think we can get started now. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Lindsay Polanski and welcome to today's webinar, Cultivating Employment, Film Screening and Panel Discussion. This webinar is being recorded and all participants are in listen only mode. This webinar all, does also have live closed captioning, so you'll just wanna enable that at the bottom of your screen um, if you do want to utilize that feature. You can send in questions through the Q&A feature and we will answer questions um, for the next 45 minutes. Um, and please note that the recording of the webinar will be available on our website tomorrow. And I'll send an email out to everyone who registered um, with more information about how to access that recording tomorrow. Um, I will now hand it off to Maggie Nygren, who is the Executive Director and CEO of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities for introductions. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Maggie Nygren. I'm very pleased to welcome this panel to discuss the award-winning film Hearts of Glass. This film is particularly noteworthy to AAIDD in that it was selected for AAIDD's 2020 Media Award. The um, Media Award is presented in recognition of uh, this film's contributions in depicting Americans with disabilities in a positive light. I hope everyone has had a chance to see the film for themselves, and I'm sure you'll agree that it presents a very interesting look into the first months of a startup company called Vertical Harvest. What makes this startup a little bit different is that the company's employees include people with disabilities. Um, before the panel gets formally introduced, I would like to recognize Jennifer Tennekin of Gen 10 Productions for her award-winning film, Hearts of Glass, which ties together some of the basics for us, that is food, community inclusion, and competitive employment. Had our conference not been canceled this year, <laughs> in addition to presenting the award uh, to Jen, we would have screened the film and held a discussion with the filmmaker and, and some others. While the physical award has unfortunately not arrived in time for the webinar, it is on its way, and we were able to work together to make the screening and uh, discussion available. Um, congratulations to you, Jennifer. And today I'm happy to introduce the panelists, Jennifer Tennekin, Director of Hearts of Glass, Johnny Feifel, Senior Microgreen Associate at Vertical Harvest, Emily Churchill, Production Manager at Vertical Harvest, and Marty Blair, Executive Director of the University of Montana's Rural Institute, who is also a member of the advisory committee for this film. Thank you all. Great, so we, um, I now wanna get started with a few um, questions they have started so the participants can learn a bit about, more about um, our panelists today. So I first want to start by asking for a little background of yourselves. Um, what do you do? Where do you live? What are you passionate about? And what brought you to Vertical Harvest? Hi, I grew up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming since 1993. I'm very passionate about civil rights. And I first learned about Vertical Harvest at a presentation in Teton County Library in December of 2013. And I, start, I started working at Vertical Harvest on March of 2016. March 28th, 2016. Hi. Um, hi everyone, I'm Emily Churchill. I am the production manager um, and I have been at Vertical Harvest, um, I guess, so I started out as a volunteer actually same same time as Johnny, actually in March of 2016, I started volunteering. Um, and then I got hired about six months later um, in the fall of that year. And um, it was a total coincidence that I happened, I'm originally from uh, upstate New York and I 
moved to Jackson in January of 2016, which was the month that the greenhouse opened. And um, that was a total coincidence and worked out really, really well for me. I feel very lucky because uh, definitely I found my dream job in this tiny little town in Wyoming. And um, I have a biology degree and um, also a teaching background uh, prior to this. So I had some experiences that have helped me be successful at this job, but I had never worked on a farm before, indoor or outdoor. Um, and yeah, so I've been at Vertical Harvest for four years now. Hi, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us for this discussion. We really look forward to a lively uh, and interesting discussion with you. I'm Marty Blair. I'm the Executive Director of the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities, which is University of Mon at the University of Montana. It's Montana's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, or the USED, U-C-E-D-D. -D. I've been there for about seven years, and I'm, I'm passionate about uh, opportunities for people with disabilities to be more included and participating more in the communities of their choice. Uh, early on in my career, I started as a special education teacher. Um, I was a middle school and a high school special education teacher, and my focus at that time many years ago was transition and helping individuals successfully transition from a life of school and education to a life of, to a life of uh, work and independent living and community uh, participation. So when I found out about this project a few years ago, um, I was very excited about uh, learning how a startup company with a uh, with certainly a, a, a business model to make money, which is what businesses do, and to learn about their social mission as well to provide transition and employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities. And these things were happening together. It wasn't a business started first, then deciding to bring people with disabilities along these missions were growing together and I was very intrigued by the idea and I'm I, I've been very pleased with the story that's been told and um, uh, I've learned a lot and I look forward to your thoughts about this as well so that's me and uh, happy to be with you today and um, I'm Jennifer Tenekin. I'm the director of the film. And I just wanted to take a moment and thank both the AAIDD and the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities for co-presenting this virtual event and giving your networks access to stream the film for a week. We're all, I think, struggling to stay in contact with our stakeholders and virtual events are certainly a safe way to do it. So we're excited about being safe. We have uh, definitely a safe group here, uh, Johnny, and Emily are both wearing their masks because they're actually in a room together. They're distanced by more than six feet. But I just want to assure you we're modeling good behavior here. Um, a little bit about me. I've been making documentary films for about 20 years. Um, I moved to Jackson in 2002 and I started telling community stories. Uh, two of my previous films have um, been broadcast on public television and um, Although they're sort of hyper local stories, one focused on a, um, a local bar here that has a long history of music um, and a house band and how music sort of breaks down barriers. Uh, that was the first film. And then the second film I did about a conservation icon. So I, I think the through line in my films are stories about community and how we are more similar than we are dissimilar. So that's kind of how the story of Vertical Harvest fits into the trajectory of my filmmaking. Um, I had just finished up uh, my previous film when I realized the greenhouse was uh, almost completed the construction phase and people were about to get in there and start growing things and start, you know, learning how to operate the business. So it seemed like um, kismet for timing and uh, and I jumped right in and it was nice that the um, everyone involved with the business was welcoming. And, um, and one other thing, I didn't have uh, much of a background in disability. So one of the things that I think I'm good at is knowing what I don't know. So one of the people that I reached out to was Marty to get a little more perspective on um, disability, disability advocacy, language, how to, um, how to treat the subject matter and the individuals with disabilities who we'd be interviewing and including in the film. Um, 
you know, in an equitable and uh, favorable way that we, we could actually interact. These were things that were not necessarily in my wheelhouse to begin with. Great, thank you. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, the next uh, question I have for you is, what were your initial concerns um, about working at Vertical Harvest, if you had any? Um, did you know what you'd be doing at the greenhouse or your training or what your job would entail? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay. I needed a, I just needed a, I just needed a decent change of pace. See, I used to work at the Elk Country Inn. I've, I used to work at the Elk Country Inn. I fold as a housekeeper. I folded clean towels, carried bags of dirty laundry. And I had to water plants every morning and afternoon during the summer. My initial concern was, how am I supposed to be happy with Kevin Barker harass, annoying me all the time? He was a, Kevin was a coworker of mine. What? L Country Inn. Oh. What for? Okay. When Vertical Harvest opened, it was my saving grace. Not sure. My coworkers thought I got unthought I was struggling. I've been struggling. I've been struggling at the old country end. Well, well, but then my job, this job was, Vertical Harvest was the perfect place to start fresh. And I used to do the, all right, that summer I used to do deliveries often and I did take part in training. I guess that's about it. Thanks, Donnie. Yeah. Um, like I said before, I started out as a volunteer with the project. Um, I had a coworker at a, a different job. Um, I, wor I worked at the ski resort here in Jackson when I first moved here, and I, uh, a coworker at the ski resort told me about the greenhouse, so I started volunteering. Um, I don't remember having a lot of initial concerns. I really just completely dove headfirst into the project because I just felt like it was such an incredible uh, incredible learning opportunity and I um, I tried to volunteer as much as I could and you know volunteer for as many different things as I could because I just wanted to learn as much as possible um, and yeah after some perseverance I ended up getting hired and that was super exciting and um, and yeah, I think even though, so we're in, uh, I guess, year four right now, um, which is crazy. And I think that uh, we're, we're, it still feels like a very young company. We're still, we still have so much to figure out, even though we've made so much progress and we've come so far. So I think, you know, every year presents new challenges, but um, I don't really remember having any initial concerns. I just remember loving the community and loving working with plants and and the combination was uh really a dream come true for me so um it has been yeah it's been a great experience uh, this this question is more for probably those that have worked or are working at vertical harvest and that's not something i've ever done um, my role in this whole thing was to serve as an advisor to the documentary film process. And uh, I, for me, the interest was, how is the story gonna be told and what kind of policy discussions could come from, could come from a film like this? Would people with disabilities be treated fairly? Would they be shown 
uh, fairly as and as competent individuals? Uh, would they would this um, vertical harvest group be treating people with respect? Uh, would the employees be receiving a competitive and fair wage? And how would that story be told? Because for, for our interest is uh, how can how can we further this policy discussion to improve employment opportunities, real competitive employment opportunities and integrated uh, employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities. And that's been my interest from the beginning is making sure that story is told and that this film I see as a, as a great prompt for continued discussion. It's a step in the right direction, it's not perfect, but I think what they've tried to do is a step in the right direction. How can we use this as a way to prompt ongoing discussion and improve policy improvements? Um, so I think um, my, my concerns going into this project were, uh, as a filmmaker, I had uh, made films that were retrospective, as in things had already happened, and this film was unfolding, or this story was unfolding in real time. So I think there was a certain amount of stress about, are we covering the right things? Uh, when should we be at the greenhouse? Who are our characters? What kind of story arcs will there be? Um, so that was, that was a, uh, a thing that made me a little bit nervous and certainly kept us on our toes. Um, you know, again, what I mentioned before, coming in without uh, a terribly nuanced view of disability and disability advocacy and making sure that I got um, folks on board to support my uh, extended learning and um, introduction into sort of best practices, um, language, um, how to conduct interviews, uh, different ways that people uh, might communicate, just expanding my boundaries, I think, both sort of a, a heart and mind experience around um, you know, intelligence and the way people communicate and what people bring uh, to the story. You know, I think the strength and I think what what Marty has said about it is that um, the strength of the business is that the its desire to fill a community need, actually two community needs, sort of grew together. You know, maybe first initially came the desire to provide year-round produce in a, a place where it's challenging to uh, grow more than four, <laughs> outdoors more than four year, months a year, um, but also to fill a need for competitive, um, meaningful jobs for people in the community with intellectual, developmental, and other disabilities. So I think the combination of those two things um, was very exciting, but it it uh, it also created uh, I think trepidation about how are we going to can we balance the story between the business and the characters. Um, so basically, I was a stress ball the entire time. So that was what I, I was fearful of everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, our. Next question is from a, an attendee today um, who asked what kind of opportunities for upward mobility and leadership exist for employees at Vertical Harvest. In the film, she says we saw some outstanding individuals receiving promotions, but are there opportunities for employees to achieve management roles as well? Um, Emily, do you want me to start with that? And Okay, so, um, you know, I think it's it's very important to realize that the film represents this snapshot in the business's life, the first 15 months, and things have progressed since then. And uh, two characters that you see in the film, they're not in major roles. Um, so Sean Stone and Michelle, who I don't know if she's identified in, in the film by a, a title, uh, but, but two individuals have now uh, moved into management positions where they are salaried and they have a health stipend. So, you know, I think one of the things that, that is very good about what's happening with Vertical Harvest is people do have upward mobility and the business itself recognizes that if you aren't moving people with of all abilities into management positions, then you're you're talking the talk, but you're not walking the walk. So that that's the information that I have. Great. Okay. 
Oh, Emily, did you want to say something? Um, I, yeah, just thank you, Jen, for answering that. That's, you know, what I would have said too. And I think that um, as a greenhouse staff, we are kind of constantly thinking about um, how can we, yeah, how can we provide upward mobility for all of our employees while also progressing the farm to the place we want it to be? Because, you know, Nona, who is our CEO, she likes to um, talk about all of us as unexpected farmers because a lot, pretty much nobody in the building uh, came to this project with prior indoor farming experience. And so we've all been learning as we go and there's been so much, um, yeah, just so much to learn and so much to improve on. And so I think that um, as a manager and, and I know, I feel comfortable, you know, speaking for other managers in the greenhouse too, because I, we meet about this every week, but you know, I'm sitting down every day and thinking not only how do I grow more food, but how do I, you know, grow more processes and, and more um, tools and, and basically ways to make the green, make everybody in the greenhouse be able to do any different job on any different day. And I think that um, as managers, ultimately our our goal is to is to work ourselves out of a job and be able to train the people below us to take our jobs and and I think that the hope for all of us, at least for at least for me, from my perspective, I think um, I'm, as we talk about building more greenhouses in more locations, which we are hoping to do, um, all of us are are hoping to kind of you know train the people who work in our departments below us so that everyone can kind of progress up, and we can also all you know go and travel to new greenhouses and kind of be consultants there and and help set up new farms. And I think that a lot of people in our greenhouse are positioning themselves really well to do that, not just um, manager, not just current managers, but like all of our employees. And, and so I think that that is a, definitely a form of upward mobility for us too, is that um, we can, we are, we're looking to, towards this replication aspect, which um, really will provide a lot of opportunities for a lot of future people. This is Marty, and again, I'm not an employee of Vertical Harvest, but one of the things that I've been watching closely is how are individuals with disabilities and individuals without disabilities working together, and how are they um, being promoted together? And I think that while there's been some success, maybe some failure, at least in my observation, and maybe I think this is getting to your question, uh, I think that what I've noticed, what I've observed is that the organization, the company itself, is trying to find a way to move all employees up and to give that opportunity for all employees and so that it doesn't become a sheltered workshop or an enclave or anything like that it's it's a business where people with and without disabilities are working side by side and they can move up together in management ranks that's my observation and there's a long way to go Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is from a participant who asked, could you discuss the business model a little bit more in depth? Um, this person works in Michigan and thinks that this business model would be a great fit in, in Western Michigan. Um, I am not the best person to be asking about the business model. As I said in the beginning, um, I'm the production manager. So my job is I'm in charge of growing all the plants and then managing all of the people that grow all the, that help me grow all the plants. So um, the business side of it is definitely not my area of expertise. Um, but I can tell you a, a little, the, the, I can tell you what I do know. Um, our business model is, um, we basically have like a triple bottom line. So we have three, um, three things that define success for us, which is, um, you know, sustainability, growing food and doing that sustainably, um, growing futures, providing jobs. And then the third one is financial sustainability. So, um, you know, we're, we're, a version of a social enterprise um, and 
Um, it is, as, uh, as Marty point said earlier, it's not a nonprofit, it is a business and where um, our CEO and our, our whole staff feels really strongly about that, that we are, um, yeah, we're not a charity or we're not um, a sheltered workshop or anything like that. We're really out to prove that this business model can be successful. Um, and we're all really passionate about that. And I think that's why we're all, you know, willing to put in the long hours and work, work really hard for this startup. Um, Jen, I don't know if you want to add anything on to that, but that's my, that's my take. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just add a few things that I know. Again, I'm like Marty, I'm not the business and I don't work at Vertical Harvest, uh, but I do know a little bit about the backstory. Um, you know, it took about six or seven years of community, well, driving effort from the three co-founders of uh, Vertical Harvest to get the community on board. Um, I don't know what you know about Jackson Hole, but uh, land values are extremely high here, and this could have never happened without uh, town land being used. And this was a remnant uh, strip of land left over from a public parking garage. It was basically an unusable strip of land and they put out an RFP, a request for proposals, the town did, and Vertical Harvest was eventually selected. Um, so it is a public-private partnership with the town of Jackson. Vertical Harvest pays rent for um, the land and owns the building. Uh, so it is a source of revenue for the town. So these creative ways to finance things uh, through public-private partnerships, I think it's an excellent lesson in creative business thinking, um, getting community organizations, uh, getting uh, businesses on board. Um, the culinary circle is mentioned a couple of times in the film and Vertical Harvest could have not gone forward without the support of local restaurants. You know, we have a lot of high-end restaurants here. We're a super tourist community, which is, as you can imagine right now, presenting some challenges in various ways. But, um, you know, the buy-in, financial and, um, you know, the theoretical in the model um, was critical to it moving forward. So businesses, um, uh, restaurants put in a $10,000 donation for the right to buy uh, a share at market value, a share of the produce at market value. So that was an economic model that made sense. Um, I think the project really turned the corner and Emily, you and Johnny, you probably uh, know this as well. Um, Vertical Harvest received a $1.5 million matching grant from the Wyoming uh, Business Council, and it only won the vote by, I think, one vote. Um, so, but that was critical. That really moved it ahead. And then uh, the three women behind it were in overdrive finding funders to match that $1.5 million grant. But, you know, I mean, it basically took an entire community and multiple years to get it off the ground. So, I think um, in a lot of ways, this is uh, an, a groundbreaking experiment and uh, it's a test case. And what Vertical Harvest, I think, is trying to do now is take all the things they've learned and continue to learn and roll it out as they think about replication in other communities. And um, I don't know, uh, th there is one um, going on in Pennsylvania, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, right, Churchy? I mean, Emily. <laughs> and, um, and I believe uh, they're looking at something in Portland, Maine as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question. That's great, Jen. I feel like you answered a few questions um, along the way, which was great. <laughs> um, question about gaining support from community businesses and restaurants. Um, what lessons were learned that could be shared with other initiatives? Emily, do you want to take that or do you want me to try? Well, I think it was a little bit before my time, I think uh, I didn't I didn't start with the project until it was already up and running. So I'm not I'm not sure exactly how much how much work into went into it ahead of time. 
Um, so yeah, do you want to try? <laughs> Um, Lindsay, so just to, uh, the question is, can you just repeat it for me? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so it was a question about gaining support from community businesses and restaurants um, that really helped, you know, the greenhouse start up and what lessons were learned that could be shared with other initiatives? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, from what I observed, just the commitment of the um, the the women behind the Vertical Harvest to sort of tirelessly reach out to potential collaborators, partners, supporters. Um, you know, I think um, it's always scary with a startup uh, to promise things where you haven't really done them before. Uh, but I think everybody also knows that. Um, you know, you're breaking new ground. There's quite an uncomfortable moment in the film, you may remember, where there's a discussion with members of the culinary circle and there's sort of a, a frank assessment of them not getting the kind of produce that they were hoping for and Nona kind of having to recapitulate that, you know, the tomato debacle, you know, really sort of took the wind out of their sails. So, you know, I mean, I think the lesson is you just have to keep forging forward, you have to do, they did a lot of due diligence, even though nothing, you know, no one had built a greenhouse at this altitude, um, um, latitude, uh, with this amount of technology in it before, but they did everything they could to be prepared. But then there's still a certain level of, we're not sure what's going to happen. So you should have partners who, um, understand that and can be a little bit flexible or have advocates, uh, at least some advocates in your group of supporters um, who can help communicate that because there are going to be ups and downs. And, you know, I think um, the reason that they allowed me to tell this story is I think they understand that other companies, other projects can benefit from this kind of transparent and real storytelling where not everything goes according to plan and people have to deal with unforeseen issues and there are all sorts of challenges. But, um, but ultimately, you know, when you believe in something and when it's a good model, I think, you know, the results end up to be positive. Absolutely. Um, and our next question, just curious about changes that have occurred since the ending of filming in the summer of 2017. Um, what have there been, what changes have there, have happened with work responsibilities, title, pay, um, connections with colleagues and social networks, um, things like that. Johnny, would you like to start? All right. Sorry, where were we? Oh, no problem. Um, question just about how have things changed since the ending of the filming in, in the summer of 2017? Oh. oh, it's really simple. I've been getting, I've been getting a couple raises, 11.50 per hour, then it was bumped up to 13.25. I've, I've been able to go on, I've been able to go on I go on a business trip. I went to Chicago in 28th, no, 29th, last August. Then I went to, Cal I went to California last January of 2019. Then I went to Washington in 2018. I'm, I'm going to just jump in for, for one quick moment. Johnny, can you mute for a sec? Right. Um, so, so Johnny was explaining all of the different um, opportunities we've had to do outreach and engagement, leveraging the film and the business. Um, so that was just, you know, we have presented at conferences, the NACDD, the and uh, well, lots of acronyms, sorry, I'm, yes, the N, 
<laughs> NDSSSS, I don't know what, anyway, um, all of these different uh, opportunities to present at conferences and then um, film screenings and, um, and then community screenings. Uh, we did a Wyoming tour um, last fall and Johnny uh, presented at his old alma mater. Yeah, it's true. I went to the University of Wyoming from 2011 to 2015. Hello? So, so if, can I, this is Marty, and I just, I'm interested in asking Johnny a question. Um, Johnny, how, how have your, you talked about your previous job, that it, it wasn't something you liked, but this is one it seems that you like. Can you tell us a little bit about why why this job is different for you and how it's how it's making uh, your life different uh i'm not sure i'm not really sure actually okay do you like this job better than the one you had before and why yeah less distance mm -hmm. yeah. i'm not sure i could bike there in the summer And I didn't, ha I didn't have to carry any bags of dirty laundry. <clears throat> what about with coworkers? I'm interested also in, in coworkers. Uh, oh, the no, coworkers were nicer that... to me. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh. So can I jump in just for a second? Um, uh, I think the coworkers being nicer uh, is partly um, due to a corporate culture, and and Vertical Harvest doesn't ha isn't the only business with a corporate culture of inclusion and diversity that uh, encompasses disability, but um, they are super committed to it. And maybe Johnny, can you talk about um, some of the things, the extracurricular <laughs> business stuff that you get involved with? It's um, oh yes, yeah. Every summer we used to do kickball. <laughs> We would even do, let's see. I forgot what we did. Well, we do lots of happiest hours. Oh, we did happiest hours. Oh, yes. We did happiest hours every month. Can, can you explain what the happiest hour is to people who aren't oh. familiar? Oh we, would, oh, we would do an outing. We would go out to restaurants. We would even go to we would even go to a movie. Oh yes, every uh, during the winter we used to go bowling. That's great. It sounds like such a fun activity to do. <laughs> it is. Um, that sounds awesome. I have um, one more question um, about filming. And what was the most interesting thing everyone learned from making this documentary? Uh, uh, have you, what do you feel like you learned from watching it now? Oh, that, okay. I've learned. I learned from what I learned that people with disabilities is can work anywhere if given the chance. Is that you, what you think the big takeaway is? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for me, watching the film is always 
um, it just feels it's such a time travel experience because even though it wasn't that long ago, it, it seems so different now, um, I guess. And to explain that a little bit more, I think, um, you know, honestly, the first year was every day we went in there and uh, we were just kind of figuring it out as we went. And now having been through all four seasons a, a couple of times now, um, you know, again, I, I, gr I grow the plants. So I think about um, I think about the, the plants and the people pretty equally, but I, you know, it's super different to be in, to grow in that greenhouse in the summertime when it's 70 degrees here versus the winter time when it's can get down to negative 30. Um, and, you know, having been, yeah, been through the seasons a bunch and learned, we've all kind of learned how to actually grow plants in that building, which has been which is a huge difference, quite frankly, from when we opened. And also I think that um, our staff is a lot bigger now. I think um, I think there are a couple questions about how many people are employed. And I think our payroll is, is close to 40 people at this point and not all 40 of those people are full time. Um, maybe a third of or half of the people are full time. Um, some people have other jobs they want to do and some people don't want to work all the time. Um, and so that's a really big difference too. And I think also, you know, we kind of put a lot of effort into developing procedures and processes and, and um, SOPs, standard operating procedures. And, you know, we have, we kind of have our defined departments now and, and, um, and you know the roles and and again as um marty and jen were talking about earlier just we kind of have a better idea of people's progression from you know and you know just starting out as a new employee to you know what does it look like to what are the steps you have to accomplish to get up to a manager and so anyways so many things have changed um so it's really um it's always so interesting and kind of emotional for me to watch the film because we've just come so far and it and it's really honestly it's really nice to reflect on because i think that um that you know there's a lot of challenges still and we're still working we're still working everything out and we're um you know we're still in we're still a startup and so to but to look back and be like oh yeah like we really have accomplished a lot in the past couple years is, is always um, a nice pause. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, I, you know, I love the film and I love that it allows, um, I, I just love that Jen has been able to share this story because I'm obviously very passionate about it and I, and I want as many communities to have this kind of project or something similar to it as possible. And so, um, for me, I think the big takeaway for the film, yeah, is really to, is to kind of like opens people, open people's minds to what, to the possibilities and, and just kind of like, you know, get out there and just do it. And, um, not, not to say that it doesn't take a lot of careful planning as well, but I think that, um, if this film can inspire more people to start more similar projects, then that is amazing. And I think for me quickly is that uh, if we want to, if, if we're committed as a, as a society, as a community to uh, have competitive employment and then integrated employment opportunities available for people, then there need to be businesses that can survive and thrive. And I think what I've learned from this process and observing this process is uh, you need to have a surviving, thriving business. And with people who are committed. And when you have a group of people that are committed, not only to making the business work, but to including people of all abilities in the workforce in a competitive and integrated way. And that partnership can include the community. It can it uh, includes um, government and tax breaks or um, just innovative thinking about business development. I think when you put all of those things together, you can come up with some very innovative solutions that promote business on the one hand, 
but also give individuals with disabilities uh, equality of opportunity and equity of opportunity uh, to participate in the employment world, which gives them uh, open doors into independent living and uh, integration, full integration and inclusion in our communities. That's the lesson I took from this. Um, I, I think for me, just realizing what a broad audience we have a chance to um, reach and, and have the story resonate with and an opportunity to not only engage, but to educate and for the film to be used as a tool uh, to help drive better outcomes around um, employment and community inclusion. So I think we're, we're trying to think creatively about ways we can um, work with organizations where we're complement where the the film can be used as a tool to complement um, the organization's work and uh, marty was actually part of a team that worked on a very extensive viewers guide we have an 80 page resource that includes case studies and touches on sort of all different aspects of the building resource uh, of the building of the of the film i, I don't know why i said that <laughs> Um, but but um, I, I think that the exciting part is the audiences we can reach and the way different um, organizations might be able to use the film. I mean, we have had very positive responses from obviously disability advocacy groups and, and um, membership organizations, uh, as well as government agencies like vocational rehabilitation, uh, parent resource centers, uh, transition educators, um, We've done a lot of screenings at colleges and universities. And I think that's kind of exciting and that it brings, this is the next generation that's gonna be working in a lot of the fields that the film touches on, whether it's um, social impact businesses or innovative agriculture or social work or disability studies. Um, we'd like to think that, that the film um, you know, can reach the right people so it can be used as a tool. And we're, we're super excited that we're actually going to national PBS later this year um, in honor of the ADA's 30th anniversary. Um, so, you know, I've just learned that a lot of people are interested in this kind of story. And we have a lot of people thanking us for bringing um, a real, but, um, uh, uplifting story. This is a time when we need some uplifting stories. So um, you're welcome. Great. And I feel like that was such a great place to, to end our discussion today. So I just really want to thank um, all of our panelists for joining us. Um, and for sharing such an amazing film with us all. Um, if you haven't had the chance to watch the film yet, it will be available until Friday. Um, so I will be emailing um, tomorrow when I email the link to today's recording. I'll also include the link. So if you didn't get a chance to watch the film yet, you'll be able to watch it until Friday. Um, so just thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, I do want to mention before we head out today that our next webinar will be on July 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern. It's titled Key User Interface Design Features of Social Media Apps and Their Impact on Usability for People with Disabilities. With that, I hope everyone has a great evening and thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.